right. <clears throat> good morning. Woo, I needed that. <clears throat> that was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Amen. I needed some of that. Thank the Lord that we don't worship in Arrowhead Stadium. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I mean, I realize it's Patrick Mahomes, but this is Jesus. I wonder if as many people would show up if we were in the stadium. <laughs> Crazy. Um, <clears throat> I don't like the cold weather. That's why I live where I live. South Texas. I've lived in North Dakota. That was no fun. <clears throat> I made it five winters. <clears throat> and then I came home because I think the Lord moved out up there. I don't think he stays there. <clears throat> Excuse me. All, all year round. And so today, we're back in our series, back on track. Um, and uh, last week, I talked to you guys uh, a little bit about being back on track. And, and, and when I say track, I mean the racetrack, you know, I mean running. And, and so we talked a little bit about how to think, not resolution, uh, but how to think uh, instead think about commitment. And so this week, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about thinking about uh, e thinking eternally instead of thinking temporarily. Okay? <clears throat> so we have to change our thinking up to be in the place where God wants us to be if we're going to be back on track. Now, the problem is that people operate from a fundamental mindset that really determines all their perspective on how they see the things of their life. And there's two main mindsets, mindsets. Either you can think with the mindset of eternity, or you can think of the mindset of today, the temporary. And it changes how you do the life. The temporary is focused on the here and now, but the eternal is focused on heaven. And I love this scripture. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, it says this. It says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. You see, spiritually, we're in a mind battle, the scripture tells us. We fight over the mind, trying to take captive for Christ the mind. There's this battle to either think in the temporary or to think in the eternal. Uh, maybe you've heard the old saying, I've used this before, I've said this about some guys. That guy's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Okay? Have you heard anybody said that? Say that, you know, somebody that wasn't working very hard. He's so heavenly minded, he's not even earthly good. He's just lazy, right? The reality is most of the time that's reversed. Most of the time people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. Okay? And so we don't want to be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good because as believers in Christ, our focus has to be on the eternal, not on the temporary. Okay? And so then we have to ask ourselves the question, well, how do I stay focused on eternity? It's so easy to get caught up in this world that I live in because it's, it hits me every day in the face. It's tough. It's hard. It's there. I have to deal with it. It's every day. And so how do I really get my mind to stay focused on the eternal uh, because God has changed my way of thinking. He's changed my life. He's changed my mind. And so how can I really walk in deepness of that in my own life? Does that make sense? And so I, I want us to try to get that a little bit. So there's a couple of things that we have to do to make that begin to happen. Number one is we have to have the mind of Christ. That's going to be our goal, is to have the mind that Jesus wants us to have. Well, <clears throat> there's some things that we have to deal with, though, if we're going to have the mind of Christ. Number one, when your mind is on the temporary and not on the eternal, you can easily be swayed. Okay. You can easily be thrown off. You can easily be tossed about. The scripture says Ephesians chapter four, verse 13 and 14, when it's talking about how that pastors and teachers are here uh, and, and, and apostles and evangelists are here to help the church, to help the people, the believers of the church to really grow and mature. It says this, it says, uh, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed. You see that? 
We won't be tossed or blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever. They sound like the truth. You see, it's real easy to get tossed and swayed whenever you're focused on the temporary and not focused on the eternal. It can really throw you off, okay? And I don't think it's the tossing <clears throat> that bothers God all that much. I think he expects that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know what's going on in my throat. Can you hear me there? <laughs> so like I coached in Kansas City last night. <clears throat> ah, <clears throat> sound like a dolphin. Okay, I'm all right. Uh, it, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's the tossing that God is so worried about because we all face things that are going to toss us around a little bit. We're all going to come on bumps in our life. We're all going to get... I think the thing that bothers God is the fact that we're having spiritual turbulence and that spiritual turbulence is causing us to get thrown off track. Okay? And so we have to ask our questions. What is it that's causing me so much spiritual turbulence? Why aren't I stronger in this? The reality is normally it's because we haven't reached the place of maturity that the Lord wants us to reach yet. And our lack of spiritual maturity allows us to be tossed about. Have you ever, you ever seen a big cargo ship that is a giant, humongous ship, but when you throw it out on a tossed, rough, uh, wind-blown, stormy sea, it looks like a little pebble being thrown around. I mean, the sea looks angry about it. And the reality is that whenever you're spiritually being tossed about a little bit, this world can get angry with you. It can throw you around. It can toss you around. So if you don't have that mindset on Christ the way you need it to be set on Christ, it's going to be real easy for you to be tossed about because you're going to experience some spiritual turbulence and you're not going to be ready for it because you're not the place where God wants us to be. And so that's why we have to be careful as we're trying to develop the mind of Christ in our own lives. Okay? So that, that's the first thought we have. The second thought is, when the mind is set on the temporary and not the eternal, it's never satisfied. It's never fully satisfied. It's never full. It's never complete. There's an emptiness that always exists. Psalms 107 verse 9 says this. It says, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Who does? God does. God is the only one that can satisfy us. He's the only one that can fill us with everything that we need, okay? The problem about this world, the problem about the temporary and the things that this world offers, that offers us, it's just a little bitty tiny salad. That's all it is, okay? It's got little bitty, you know, it's just like the little bitty house salad. It shows up, it's 80% water. There's really no nutrition in there, okay? And it's got little bitty tomatoes this big. It's got about five of those in there. Some sliced cucumbers there. It's got some little carrots sliced up. It's just a little baby salad. When you eat it, you're still empty, and God, he wants to give us the meat and the potatoes and the stuff that fills you up and makes you feel manly and makes you feel like watching a football game and falling asleep at halftime. You know what I mean? I mean, that's the stuff. We don't, we don't want a little dinky salad we're trying to eat and trying to figure out why, you know, I'm not getting full and I'm hungry three minutes later, okay? Because it doesn't, it doesn't meet. It's, it's temporarily. It's not eternal. It doesn't last forever. And our minds need to be focused on that that's going to last forever, that that's going to fill us up, and that's that really is going to last, okay? And so that's what we're after in our relationship with Christ. The next idea is the idea that when the mind is set on the temporary and not on the eternal, it's really hard to change it. It's hard to switch out of that mode of being temporary. It's hard. I mean, that's why it's hard for people to come to Christ sometimes. It's hard for them to change their mindset. It's hard for them to believe in Jesus and accept the things of Christ or the things of a believer. That's just tough. Ephesians 4.17 says it this way. It says, live no longer as the unsaved do. Okay, when I say unsaved, those that don't know Christ. For they are blinded and confused. They're like the Cleveland Browns. Their closed hearts are full of darkness. I'm just kidding. Uh, they're far away from the life of God because they've shut their minds against him and they cannot understand his ways. See what I'm saying? The scripture tells us that when your mind is stuck in the temporary, it's really hard for you to open up and see the eternal that's around you. 
It, it's a hard change that, that, that you have to make. It's just hard to get out of it. It's a mode that you can get stuck in. Because the, the reality is this, living for God is so opposite of everything else that we have in this world, it's hard for us to even see it sometimes. In fact, the only way we can see it and experience it and have it is by the quickening of the Spirit when it comes into our life. That Spirit opens our eyes up to something that we've never seen before. And until we open up to that, we never really fully can experience. It just can't happen. The Bible says that we have to open our spirit up and the temporary, it just blinds us. It causes us to be colorblind. We don't see the beauty. We don't see the color. We don't see the green and the red and the blue that God begins to bring to our lives spiritually. We don't see the fruit. We don't see the passion. We don't see all the good things of God. We're blinded to all of that until the Spirit comes into us and quickens us and opens our, our mind up and changes our mind. So all of a sudden we become focused now on the, uh, the uh, eternal and not so focused on the temporary. And now we become so... So, you know, focus that now we're becoming heavenly good for what God wants us to do in our own lives. So how do we think eternal? First thing, we've got to have the mind of Christ. A second thing when we think about this is that we have to live the life of Christ. I've got to have the mind of Christ, but I've got to do a little more than that. I have to begin to live the life. Of Christ. And when you live in the eternal, all the trials of this world will begin to pass. All the trials of this world will move away. When you start living for Christ, you begin to realize that the trials of this world will begin to pass. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says it this way It says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Isn't that cool? That when you live the way Jesus wants you to live, all of the bad things, the afflicted things, the, the, the tough things in life begin to move on. They're going to pass. They're going to go. They're going to have heaven is there. We're going to move into eternity someday. All that is going to disappear. Okay? The momentary affliction. Is that a cool word? That's an Old Testament, Old Testament word, affliction. Oh my gosh. What's, what's affliction? I mean, I don't think there could be, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those words that's like being smote by God. There's just something about those. It just says boils on your body to me. I mean, sores all over me. That's a term that was used for Job. You remember Job? when God allowed him to be sifted by Satan just a little bit. And you remember that Job, it says that he was afflicted. I mean, I got the shingles one time. I think that was affliction. That felt like affliction to me. <clears throat> but Job, <laughs> right? But, <clears throat> but Job, he, he was afflicted. And, and, and whenever you're in affliction, you know, he, he was afflicted. And then all of his friends showed up. These are great friends. There's like the friends you have today. They all showed up and they sat with him and they said, and they had their Bible in front of them. They were like, now Job, obviously there's sin in your life. Don't you love friends? It's like when you get to the end of the cliff and you stop and you barely made it, they just come and push you over. Isn't that great? Job's like, well, thank you guys for pointing out all of my struggles and my humanity. Like I didn't know it already. <clears throat> I got boils on my body. Okay, I've lost half my family here. I'm struggling. I'm in affliction. See, the cool thing about believers is our affliction's only temporary at most. Okay, it goes away. You know what the problem with non-Christian is? The affliction's eternal. The affliction never goes away. You see, I think we forget sometimes as believers how hot hell really is. Sometimes we act like it doesn't exist. No, no, no. It's eternal. The problem is when you go there, the affliction is eternal. You're going to be afflicted. We don't want to live afflicted. But the cool thing about believers is if we experience affliction because both Christians and non-Christians do experience it, it's not long lasting. You guys be praying for Taylor. Okay. <clears throat> Her date for inducing birth is, January, is February the 7th now. Okay. <clears throat> so we're praying for, praying for February 7th. It has to be scheduled, so 
Full staff can be there, surgeons ready, doctors ready for birth. I'm praying God's going to send them home. But we'll see what happens. We know God has it. Taylor tells me, she's dead. I just, I just want to have a normal birth. And I said, Taylor, normal is not our plight in life. We're God's people. And guess what? The Lord doesn't ask us to be normal. He asks us to be faithful. Because he's doing something to glorify himself through his people. And we receive that. And we live that out. We trust him. We're God's people. He doesn't want us to be normal. He wants us to be faithful. And trusting. And loving. And believing. And to be his people that stand and point and say... He deserves the glory, not us. He does. That's where we stand. So the good thing about being in the eternal instead of the temporary is that we know that our affliction at most is just going to be a little while. For eternity, we're going to spend it in the presence of God. Another idea that we think about is also the idea that when you live in the eternal, today's loss is actually tomorrow's profit. Today's loss is tomorrow's profit. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says it this way. It says, And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and we are fitting into His plans. God, I'm in your plans. I'm with you. And I know you're working it for good. Now, make no bones about it. Living for Jesus has a cost. It costs something. He says to take up your cross daily and follow after him. But whatever you count as loss in God's kingdom is going to be profit in eternity. Okay? It will come back to you. Resources that you spend serving God are not really a loss. They're an investment for the future. What did the old people teach us when we were young, the elderly? They would say, be sure you pay yourself first, right? Be sure you pay yourself first. Take a couple of hundred dollars that every time you get paid and stick it in the bank for you. So it'll be there called paying yourself first. Any investment you make in the kingdom of God is paying yourself first. It just is. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then what? All of these things will be added unto you. It's just an investment. I mean, when I'm giving my resources to God, I'm investing in the kingdom. I'm paying myself first. I'm impacting my life in a spiritual way that's going to last forever. Another thing that we think of whenever we're trying to get where we're living for Christ is that when you live in the eternal, you're never overwhelmed by trying to do too much. Okay? You're never overwhelmed by that. Matthew 11, 28 says it this way. It says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heaven burdens, and I will give you rests. You see, God's people are, no, are never overwhelmed. They're never overwhelmed. They, 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 don't, you know, they don't get burdened with having too many things to do. It's really easy for us to get too busy. But as God's people, he says, if you will give that to me, I will relieve you of that burden. I like that. Living in the temporary the load gets really, really, really heavy. It just does. This world can be heavy. I mean, there's there's just a lot about it. There's relationships and there's work and there's connection with people that really aren't quite the people that I wish that they were and they've got problems and then there's my own personal struggles that I have. There's just so much. It can just get so heavy. But living in the eternal You can always carry more than you ever dreamed you could carry. And God says he will never give you more than you can what? Than you can handle. He gives you the strength for it. 
You can handle more than you can even imagine whenever you got Jesus lifting the load with you. When he comes beside you and lifts the load up. I love, I love little Tate, Trent Kirsty's little, you know, son, our, our year old grandbaby. I love him. Tate Kirsty, he loves to lift things that are bigger than him. He's so much like his dad. He just walks around, just finds stuff that's heavy and he tries to lift it. Nobody can lift this, but he might could try to lift that. And, and, and Tate, he comes into my office. He loves to get, I have a golf club in my office. It's like three times taller than him. He likes to get my golf club. He comes in and gets my golf club and drags it around my office. And he preaches to me. He's talking to me. I don't know what he's saying. He's saying a bunch of stuff. He's a talker, but I can't understand any words that he's saying. And, and, uh, and he drags, you know, he drags. And he, he just loves finding something that's big and just trying to pick it up. You know, if you give him a toy, he, they take the toy out. He doesn't really want the toy. He wants to lift the box, show that he can lift the box up, you know. And, and, and he, he lifts. And whatever he can't quite lift up, I, I get beside him and I help him lift it up. I make sure he can, right? You see, that's the way the father does to his children. When we carry a heavy weight and we begin to struggle under the weight, the Lord gets under the weight with us and he helps us lift that. And we never face anything that he can't lift. In fact, heavy things in life should have a caution on them. Do not lift without Jesus. And whenever Jesus is spotting for us, it's amazing what we can actually lift. I mean, we can lift some heavy weight because we know if I lose my balance or if if, if I begin to falter. We know that Jesus will be there to lift it for us. And so now we can lift this big, heavy weight just because we're facing and we're looking at uh, the, uh, the eternal instead of getting hung up in the temporary. And so we can lift this weight that we really never dreamed that we could lift in Christ. And so if you live in the eternal, uh, you, you, you never take on too much that you can't handle at all. God always gives you a way to deal with it. Isn't that cool? That's some of the, the privileges of just living life like Jesus wants to live life. So I'm going to have the mind of Christ. I'm going to live like Christ wants me to live. And then the third thing is this, that I'm going to share the love of Christ with other people and with this world that I live in. Okay? Now, here's the thing. When you share the love of Christ, then your mind gets set on the eternal not only temporary, and you begin to live in the real grace of God in your life. This is, how, this is where the grace of God comes from in your life. Colossians 3.12 says it this way. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself in compassion, kindness, Humility, gentleness, and what? Patience. Clothe yourself in that. Clothe yourself in the grace of God so that other people can begin to see that in you. It's very important. It's very important. My, my dad always taught me, I say this to you all the time, but I'll say it again. Some lessons are, are worth teaching a lot. My dad would always tell me, he, he, he taught me that you get up and you get dressed for the day. Okay? My dad would always get up, get dressed, get ready for the day. And he would always say, you got to get up and get dressed for the day. Okay? You got to do that. Tisa gets on to me. She goes, it's your day off. Why, what are you, you get in, I go, I got to get up and get dressed for the day. I don't know. God didn't take the day off just because I did. The Lord's still there. He may want to do something with my life today and I want to get up and get dressed and I'm going to be ready for him to do something with my life. And so I'm going to get up and I'm going to put on the grace of God every morning, right? I'm just going to put it on. I, I need it. I need that grace of God so that I can be these things, compassionate and kind and humility and gentle and patience. Let me tell you guys, Anybody can be uncompassionate, unkind, unhumble, ungentle, and unpatient. It ain't that hard. It comes natural. It takes some commitment to God to get up and say, I'm going to put your grace on. I think that's what Jesus means some a little bit when he says, take up that cross every day and put it on. Get ready for the day because I have something spiritual to do through you every day. And every day is a prized day that God gives us to move forward. 
If it's 18 degrees the night before, I may be a little slow to do that, right? That changes that some. No, but God gives me the warmth and the passion that I need to be uh, everything that he wants me to be. And so as a believer, we have to wake up and put on our big boy spiritual pants every day and get ready to do what God has for us to do. That's just a part of sharing Christ. And another aspect of that in, in, in you know, really living in, in the eternal is that when your mind is set on the eternal, then you're going to live full of God's spirit every day, regularly. Every day you're going to wake up and welcome the presence of God's spirit in your life. Romans 8, 6 says this. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind driven by the flesh is death. But the mind governed, don't you like that word? Governed by the spirit is different. Okay? It, 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 it's peace. It's the presence of God. It's the things that we need spiritually. How are you being governed? You governed by the eternal? You governed by the temporary? You got to decide where you're, where you're at on this. Okay? I know what you're thinking. Pastor, this is election year. Don't bring up government. You want some kind of fight to happen here? Is that what you want? Why are you going to talk about the government? You know, uh, I always talk about the government in a positive way, don't I? You know that's not true, okay? <clears throat> All right? Sorry about that. All right? But, but, you know, the question is, who are you governed by? Who's governing you? Who's driving you? Is it the flesh? Is it this world? Is it the temporary or is it the eternal? This will impact how you live your life. Another way to say it would be like this. Are you regulated by the freedom of the spirit? Or are you regulated by the limitations of the flesh? Oh, yeah. There's freedom in eternal thinking. There's a lot of limitation when you're thinking temporary, when you're thinking of the flesh. And you want to live in the spirit. That should be our mindset. We should live differently than the world around us. We want to be living in the spirit. And so you may need a spiritual revolution to take place in your life. And you may need to throw off the government of the flesh so that you can put on the government of the spirit. And the governing spirit inside us begin to do something really effective in your life. This is the way we begin to share, live life in a way that we're going to share our faith. And another aspect of that is, is the simple idea that when your mind is set on the eternal, you live out the gospel towards other people around you. Okay? When you're on the eternal and on the temporary, you're going to be what God wants you to be. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 <clears throat> says this. So we cared for you. Now this is Paul. He's talking to a church. We, we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Wow. Sharing the gospel means sharing your life. I, I preach to you a lot. Sometimes we bring in pinch hitters. Um, but preaching is not enough. You have to live it. That's why it takes some time at a congregation to really begin to make an impact on your community. It's not something that just happens overnight. I used to really struggle sharing the gospel because I would force it almost everywhere. You know? Kind of be pushy with it. Stick it down somebody's throat maybe just a little bit. The problem was I was doing it out of obligation and I really didn't understand the process. Then I ran across a book one time. The title of the book was I Hate Witnessing <laughs> by Dick Hines. Changed my life. It's a great book. It said this, if you're witnessing out of obligation, you probably need to quit. You're doing more damage than good. Because witnessing and sharing Christ comes from a loving heart. A loving heart. I learned that 
sharing the gospel effectively means that you have to also share your life. What's hard about preaching the gospel is just you open your guts up every day or every week, every Sunday for everybody to determine if they agree or not. It's like, here it is. Everybody gets to pick at that for lunch. But if it's the gospel, you have to live it out. You're sharing a part of who you are. That's just the way it works. It makes you really vulnerable. But sharing the gospel is vulnerable. I don't share it because I'm perfect. I don't share it because I got it all down. I share it because I know that Jesus changes the lives of people that commit to him. In ways that I can't even always explain. But the Bible does a pretty good job of it. As long as we preach that and live that, we're sharing Christ. We all grew up with the story of the Velveteen Rabbit, remember? That's loved by the children so that buttons are missing and the eye is missing and the ear might be missing. You know? And it's worn out. We might even say it's frazzled. But that's what made it real. It's real. And so the gospel is never given to us to be shared in our perfection is to be shared in the perfection of Jesus. He's the perfect one. He's the Savior. He's the Lord God Almighty. He's the one we worship eternally. He's the one when all of the temporary goes away is that that holds everything together. It's him. And that's our message. We share it. We live it. It's not all that clean. It's life. It's messy. But sin is messy and God hates it. We forget how bad he really hates it. We think sometimes, oh, God's okay with it. Really? Honestly? He would condemn us because of sin? Yeah, yeah, he does. But he also offers himself, his son Jesus, as a way for us to be forgiven. He sacrificed the life of his son to give us the way to be forgiven. I think he takes it really serious. Surely there would have been an easier way if it wasn't that serious. And he wants us to share that. It's our message. Come to Christ. Receive his forgiveness. Be full. Be complete. Have everything that he wants you to have. Don't go away empty. Have the eternal. Don't settle for the temporary. So we have to think, getting back on track, oh, I got to get my mind on the eternal and not on the temporary. What a challenge. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. I don't know what it would take for you to get on that track of thinking eternal. But I think God wants you to be there. So maybe there's some prayer that you could pray right now, the voice that you might personally inside of you speak to God. This is, Lord, help me do this. Help me to do whatever it takes to get back thinking fully on you. I got to get back on track spiritually. Whatever that prayer needs to be, why don't you make it right now? Asking God to refocus you. Or maybe focus you for the first time on him. So that you can begin to walk in the eternal with him. I challenge you to make that your prayer right now. Just take a few seconds. Voice whatever prayer just between you and God that you need to. Just pray that in your mind right now. Make that commitment.
Make that commitment to the Lord right now. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. God, get us on track with you. Help us to think in the eternal in everything that we do. Give us your mind. Help us to live for you and help us to share you. As your people, we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.